Faye, congratulations on this film. I had a chance to sit down and watch it today, and it's an amazing film. Congratulations. Well, brilliant. Thank you. I appreciate that. Very kind of you to say. So, I have to ask, where did the idea for this film first come about for you? Um, I, I, I was always a, a mod when I was a kid. Um, the second wave of mod, or the revival as they call it. Um, in the late 70s, early 80s. But it, it was the, the band, The Jam, really, that got me into being a mod. Um, and then years later, I, had the, um, I met Paul Weller in a, an airport um, lounge and had a selfie with him. And um, it just gave me the idea for the film based on, on one of his songs, which is, which is the title of the film. So I went away and started writing it. That was about 11 years ago. Awesome. So being in the mod lifestyle yourself, of course, that gave you a great insight to everything. Did you base some of the characters in this film on people that you knew as well? Um, I think they're probably an amalgamation of some. Um, the lead character is a little bit based on myself um, in the fact that we have a similar history because, um, as you know, our main character's dad has just died at the start of the film. You know, there's no secret there in that. And um, my dad died very suddenly when I was young as well. So there is a there is a parallel there between me and John. Um, and although I didn't own a scooter at the time, I think if I had one, I probably would have jumped on it and uh, and rode off a bit like John does. Yeah. As a screenwriter, did you find it difficult to write something that was so close to home for you, or did you actually find that? really easy because I know for writers that sometimes that familiarity makes it easy and sometimes it makes it difficult to write. I agree, Dave. It, a bit of both, really. Sometimes you've got the, that nugget of the idea and it just flows and you know what the structure is. Um, and that's the really enjoyable stuff. But I think then when you get down to the nuts and the bolts of the character's emotional journey, as well as the physical journey in this film, which is, you know, ultimately a road mover then yeah that can be tricky and can get upsetting sometimes i remember having a, the odd weep um while i was writing some of those scenes you mentioned that it was 11 years ago that you started on the film tell us a little bit about that journey to bring it to the screen because of course you worked on other projects in that time as well what was that journey like from from page to screen for this film well um Long, arduous, uh, full of false dawns and um, getting excited. I had a producer attached early doors at, around 2010 and they were, we were going to get this film made for a million pounds and people were really interested and it came very, very close um, but just didn't quite make it and then the producer went off and um, started doing uh, other things. And then it was left to lie fallow for a bit. Um, and as you say, I worked on other projects and other films. Um, but then I heard there was another mod film being made. Um, there was a rumour of Quadrophenia 2 going around at the time. Um, and I thought, well, I better get my skates on. I better pull my finger out and get this script that, I've, you know, that I'm really proud and passionate about and get it made albeit not for a million pound for, you know, a substantially amount uh, lower than that. But, um, yeah, I just, I just thought the, the time is right to get it done. And got to about 2016, I decided to do a, a small crowdfunding. And I raised um, £10,000, and I went out and shot a 20-minute promo for the film, um, starring some you know really nice friends who came down and worked for free. And using that promo, I was able to, to get it in front of investors and say, you know, if you give me the money, this is what I can do. Um, with it um, and then that that bubbled along for a couple of years we did that and then eventually I managed to raise the money um, in conjunction with a good uh, friend of mine a producer called Mike Knowles who I've worked with before on a film called Best Laid Plans and um, yeah we managed to get over the line by the skin of our teeth um, and, and shoot it in 2019 and then you know, we had to go back and do some pickups in Brighton, but the pandemic hit and that absolutely scuppered everything, not just for us, but, you know, for the whole world. Um, and we waited something like 14 months to be able to get back on set um, with all the problems that that 
drawn, you know, um, yeah. wearing masks, shooting shoot from a different angle to make it look like people stood next to each other. But we eventually got it in the can, and, you know, and here we are. It's out next week. Yeah, definitely. And like I said, this film looks amazing, and Brighton is very much a part of why this film looks so amazing. What was it like filming in Brighton? It just feels like it's one of those towns where wherever you look, there's something that you want to get on camera. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's got. I mean, it's you know, it's the the, the mod mecca, as it were. You know, started in 1964. Mods going down to Brighton, clashes with the rockers and this sort of stuff. And obviously our, our film set's a little bit more of a sedate look at Brighton. But wherever you point the camera, it looks quintessentially, quintessentially English, you know. Um, and the, there are landmarks like the pier um, and uh, the ramps where, you know, Sting rode his scooter down and Phil Daniels uh, walked along the beach, um, you know, reflecting on his life and stuff. So... We stumbled across those because you forget about Quadrophenia when you're making our film because we wanted our film to be as far away from Quadrophenia as you can possibly get, but still be a mod film. But um, yeah, Brighton was wonderful. We managed to blag ourselves on the pier uh, and film on there, which is very special and it, um, and that's a, a beautiful part of the f- uh, a part of the cinematography of the film. But yeah, it's a it's a beautiful British country, uh, sorry, seaside town. So it has that feel. I think anywhere you point a camera where the seaside, I think you're guaranteed it to, to look uh, look good. Yeah, and also looking great was the scooter, of course. John's scooter throughout this film. Tell us a little bit about how you sourced that scooter because that is an absolute... It becomes another character, really, in this film. It does. It does. I'm, glad, I'm glad you've seen that, Dave, because that's what we wanted to to get across i mean it, it's not his dad but it is almost a, like a living embodiment of his dad in the fact that his dad rode that scooter down to Brighton. we borrowed we borrowed a scooter so people people have been really really kind the mod community is really tight-knit and really supportive and when you walk into um, a scooter group who have an, a you know a weekly meeting in a pub and you say can somebody lend me a helmet and can somebody lend me a scooter people uh we're happy to do it, albeit I was like, you know, it might get a little bit bashed up, um, which was fine for the promo because it didn't get bashed up, although I did fall off the original Lambretta that we had. But for the film, we knew we had to buy one, and um, we put a Facebook appeal out saying what we were looking for, you know, is like that red, white, blue, traditional mod colours, lots of mirrors, lots of lights, and, and we bought one off a lovely guy in Manchester called Ronnie Hurst, it was very sad to see it go, but what he did say to me was, um, you know, I, I can't ride it anymore um, because he's he's got bad knees and stuff. He said, but whenever I want to see it, I can just watch your film, which I thought was lovely. Yeah, yeah. It, and what was... <laughs> And what was the scooter's temperament like? Because I worked on a film a few years ago where we had to hunt down a hot rod and we got a hot rod oh, yeah. that th- this guy had said runs perfectly, never had a problem with it, and then every time we needed it to go in the film, it would break down. So what was the scooter's temperament like? I feel your pain, Dave. Ours was exactly the same. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of banter between scooters. If you're a Lambretta rider and a Vespa rider... Lambrettas look better, they look more sleek and stylish, but Vespas are definitely a lot more reliable. And of course we had a Lambretta, and of course it didn't want to start. And of course, you know, it had problems and it was really temperamental um, and would stall at inopportune moments and you couldn't get it into gear. And for our young actor, John, uh, Patrick McNamee, who plays John, he hadn't even ridden a motorbike before, so we got him to do his... um, CBT bike test, and then you know, two days later, he sat on a 1967, I think it is, uh, LI 125 Lambretta. And we say, Off you go, mate. <laughs> <laughs> and it, you know, and it had problems, but again, with the mod community, when we were down in Brighton, wherever you looked, there was somebody that knew scooters, and so they would just come over and say, Right, get the panel off, I'll have a look at it for you. And they were amazing, they were really, really supportive, so we managed to get through. And yeah, it gets smashed up a little bit, the bike, but it's uh, it's currently residing in, uh, in my friend's shed. 
Awesome. And the character of John, as you mentioned there, Patrick McNamee playing John, he does such an amazing job. Was it difficult for you to cast that part, considering that that part of that character is based on you? Yes, um, most definitely. What what we didn't want, to, what I didn't want was, um, you know, an actor to play it like this. This kid was really cool, you know, um, and tough and hard and um, and successful with the ladies. He had to be quite young and naive and. We did. We talked to a few different actors, but um, I saw Patrick in um, a BBC drama called Our Girl, which is a medical drama that um, Michelle Keegan is in. And I'd worked with Michelle, and I spoke. I spoke to a few people about Patrick after seeing him, and we got on a Zoom call for an hour. We talked about the role. I said what I was looking for. Um, and then Patrick, because pa Patrick's um, from the northeast, so he doesn't even have a Mancunian accent. He's like a bit like how a man talks like that sort yep. of thing. So um, we spent time together, him listening to the way I speak, and he nailed the accent. I think everyone who watches it will think he's Mancunian. And he nails the subtleties of the role. And, you know, he's, there's a lot going on in his face. You know, we don't scream his dad's dead every two minutes but you, we know by John's John's reactions to the characters around him and what they're doing that he's feeling this grief all the way definitely yeah and he's well supported by Sasha as well I thought her performance in this was absolutely fantastic in fact she reminded me of Margot Robbie for most of the film how did you right. how did you discover her and what was she like to work with as well well, firstly, Dave, I'm going to tell Sasha that as soon as I get off this call. I'm absolutely <laughs> thrilled with the Margot Robbie comparison. But I see what, I see what you're saying. Um, uh, she's amazing. She, she's a perfect complement to John. You know, he's grieving. He's quiet. He doesn't want to go to Brighton, really. But she kicks his ass every two minutes. You know, and you see the things that she gets up to to do that. Um and Sasha has been attached to the project for a long time. And Sasha had worked with Mike Knowles, our producer, before. So there was that trust there. And she helped develop the character. Um, you know, and the character is a total contrast to what Sasha is in real life. Um, and she, she, you know, she had her hair dyed for the, for the film. She had her hair cut. She really stepped into Nikki's shoes. And, you know, that character, you know, like Margot Robbie is in <laughs> Suicide Squad, maybe. She's tough and she's uncompromising and you would not mess with her. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And what was it like for you directing them in those roles? Like, especially directing Patrick, because it's almost like, in a sense, you're directing yourself, kind of. Was that a kind of surreal feeling for you? Not really, no. I think once once Patrick had adopted the role of John, I think any any real reference to myself was gone. I think you have to hand it over, you know. Um, I think me and Patrick might have had a conversation early doors about the fact that, you know, my dad had died and, you know, there were some parallels. But once John gets on that journey, you know, that's different to anything I ever did because, you know, I knew my dad. My dad, I had an idyllic life with my dad before he died when I was 15. Um, we had a fantastic relationship, whereas John's in The Pebble and the Boy, doesn't know his dad that well you know we had to give him a little bit of a journey to find out some more about his dad and about what mod culture is about so it was it was quite easy to let go really um, yeah and I, I think about that and and for me because you know i'm not the most experienced director in the world um pebble at the time was my third film i think directing so i was learning all the time i think just finding the right actors and part of directing them is just setting up the, uh, giving them the right environment to work in and then saying, off you go and do your thing. And we were very lucky. It's a micro-budget film. And uh, we're very lucky that the, the, the calibre of the cast that we've got in it, you know, made my job a lot easier. Definitely. And I guess to kind of finish up, the music in this film, I'm a huge music lover and to hear some of the music that was used in this film was just absolutely amazing. As you said, the the 
film itself was inspired by music, were you kind of nervous that you wouldn't get the rights to the music that you needed for this film? Yes, very, very nervous all, all along the way. If we were making, if we were making um, Guardians of the Galaxy, which, as you know, has a wonderful soundtrack, yep. um, both films do. If we were making that film and we had, you know, £5 million budget for music, it would have been no nerves at all. But we didn't. Um, and, you know, the film is heavily inspired by Paul Weller. Um, and, you know, luckily, very luckily, Paul and his sister, Nikki Weller, have been so supportive in, in regards to the music. And so have the other bands, you know, Secret Affair, The Chords, um, and a new a new Manchester band called The Electric Stars, who are a modern-day mod band. Um, and, you know, an unsigned artist. Just be really kind, you know, We've got four Weller songs in our film. It's unheard of, you know. Yeah. Uh, Billy Elliot, I'm Call Malice. We, you know, we've got we've got these four songs that, you know, if nothing else, I think people will enjoy the soundtrack. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I was very nervous. I was very nervous about getting the music, and it went it went to the wire. Um, but yeah, we got there, and yeah, I think it really enhances the film and helps tell the story. Absolutely. It's what I heard it's described as a jukebox film. Um, I think it was my car producer said, yeah, we've got a bit of a jukebox film going on here in the fact that music is almost ever present. Yeah. Um, throughout. I did, a, I did a playlist yesterday on Spotify of all the songs that I could find, and it was an hour and five minutes long. Wow. <laughs> of the songs that we've got in the film. So, yeah. Well, mate, it's got a killer soundtrack and it is an amazing film. So to finish up, what would you like to say to everybody out there before they head out to see this stunning film? Well, one, please go out and see it. Um, It's going to be in a lot of cinemas across the UK and Ireland. Uh, We're definitely punching above our weight uh, in terms of that. We've got a great distributor on board. Um, Just go out. Don't expect to see Quadrophenia. You know, it's a million miles away from that. It's a feel-good film, and I think after the global pandemic that we've had, if you want to smile and you want to watch a film that's full of fun and a bit of excitement and a great soundtrack, then then this could be the one for you. Definitely. Well, Chris, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on our show today. It's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you, and I can't wait to see what the next film is that you work on as well.